very good afternoon to everyone and uh, welcome to the first grand round of this year 2023 we from the medicine unit 2 present before you uh, the, this uh, grand round about invasive fungal infections that we see in our wards so the fungal infections broadly divide into invasive and non invasive what we are interested is uh, in invasive fungal in, invasive infections that is invasive yeasts and molds why should we worry about it well, this is a, a recent uh, publication from our department uh, where a review of over 400 papers about the incidence prevalence uh, data was done and what what we have we have seen is about the 4.1% of the Indian population suffers from serious fungal infections, which is quite high. And in this era of increased use, overuse, or maybe sometimes misuse of antibiotics, is also uh, and increased uh, incidences or increased uh, uh, opportunities for immunosuppression uh, is leading to increase in the incidence of the invasive fungal infections and they are difficult to treat so this would be the outline of the grand round which will be started by dr anuj and uh, subsequently it will be steered by dr kirtana dr adarsh dr sayan dr amandeep and finally dr ankesh so not standing between you and them i would invite dr anuj to begin with uh, the first topic Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'll be discussing about invasive aspergillosis, which is the most common invasive fungal disease uh, with an increasing recognition of the disease burden in critically ill population over the last decade. So if we see the spectrum of aspergillosis, aspergillus related lung diseases, it varies with the underlying host immune uh, condition, uh, varying from uh, hypersensitivity with forms which have hypersensitivity, including ABPA in atopic individuals to invasive forms including invasive pulmonary aspergillosis in patients with some form of underlying immunosuppression including neutropenia. So uh, if you see this article, this was published in uh, uh, 2008. So as an atypical presentation of uh, invasive, uh, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis in a patient without classical risk factors that is non-neutropenic critically ill patients. Over the last two to three decades, there has been uh, increase in the population at risk for invasive aspergillosis with uh, increasing recognition over the last uh, one decade of uh, its prevalence in critically ill patients without neutropenia. This is also reflected in the guidelines. Uh, in 90s and two, uh, early 2000s, uh, the focus was on uh, invasive aspergillosis in neutropenic patients, uh, those with hematological malignancies and classical risk factors including uh, either primary immunodeficiency or long-term steroid use. However, over the last decade, we have had other criteria, including the ASPICU criteria, which is a clinical algorithm for patients who are non-neutropenic and presenting in critically ill settings uh, and critically ill. So uh, the recent updates have been EORTC 2019 for the neutropenic patients and the BM ASPICU 2021 and the EORTC uh, 2021 guidelines for critically ill patients. So the classical risk factors include some form of underlying uh, uh, neutropenia, either hematological malignancies or transplant settings along with uh, high dose steroids for long time. While in critically ill patients, uh, a variety of comorbidities have been shown to be associated with uh, risk for invasive aspergillosis. This include lung, chronic lung conditions, diabetes, um, hepatic dysfunction or preceding viral pneumonias. So how uh, we will compare our data with two cohorts. One is the asp ICU cohort, which was a multi-center study included, which included more than 500 patients across the globe. And the FISF study, which was from India in around 11 tertiary care centers in an ICU setting. So overall, the prevalence of uh, invasive aspergillosis has hovered around 10% uh, in our setting with a post-COVID rise as with other fungal diseases. In the, uh, in the recent um, years, it's more than 20% 20, uh, 20 and the overall mortality, uh, overall proportion which is constituted by invasive aspergillosis is quite significant, around 70%. If we compare with other data, FISF data had around 75% of the total IFI being contributed by invasive aspergillosis, while another study from AIMS, which actually uh, showed 40%, however, only one-fifth of these patients were from ICU setting. 
Now, how do our pa patients compare with uh, other cohorts? So our patients are usually one decade younger as compared to say the ASPICU cohort. Mo uh, as in the other cohorts, it's mostly males, but our patients are usually sicker at presentation with higher Apache and SOFA scores. And the mean time to diagnosis over the years has improved both with increased awareness, better biomarkers, and also with an active surveillance for invasive fungal infections. Now, what about the risk factor profile? So, as compared to other cohorts, most of, their, most of our patients have multiple comorbidities. Uh, diabetes and CKD were quite uh, more frequent as compared to both the ASPICU cohort and the FISF study. In addition, we had a significant proportion of chronic lung diseases and autoimmune conditions, while uh, classical risk factors, that is transplant settings and also long-term steroids were uh, less in our population as compared to the ASPICU or the FISF cohort. Now, what about the species? So, in the ASPICU cohort and most of the Western literature, predominant species is fumigatus, although this has changed over the years. While in the FISF study, as well as our studies, our data, there is a significant proportion of non-fumigatus species, uh, including flavors and terriers, which would have an impact on therapy since uh, they have higher MICs to say amphotericin for uh, flavors and also uh, as um, terriers is usually inherently resistant, resistant to amphotericin. Now coming to the diagnostics, first we will start with galactomannan. So a variety of assays are available but the uh, largest evidence and the most commonly used is the platelia enzyme immunoassay. The, uh, the cutoff for galactomannan varies with the underlying uh, host. So in neut uh, since neutrophils are natural scavengers of uh, galactomannan, neutropenic uh, patients tend to have higher galactomannan levels uh, that which is reflected in the cutoffs. So EORTC 2019 for neutropenic patients, a single serum or bowel sample more than one or a paired serum and bowel sample more than 0.7 or 0.8 respectively, while for non-neutropenic patients, it's 0.5 and 0.8. Now, what about the data? So, as uh, as you can see, uh, overall, serum galactomannan is less sensitive as compared to, say, bowel galactomannan. And as we go higher up with the cutoffs, the sensitivity drops. Similarly, uh, if you see uh, patients with uh, hematological malignancy or transplant settings who have underlying neutropenia, in them, the sensitivity for serum galactomannan is quite good, but for critically ill patients without uh, neutropenia, the sensitivity and specific, uh, sensitivity is quite poor. However, BAL compares similarly between uh, patients with underlying uh, neutropenia or non-neutropenic patients. So, what about our data? So, overall, the sensitivity in, in serum and BAL is quite good. However, specificity is quite poor. And the best cutoffs for BAL galactomannan is higher in our data as compared to, say, uh, say the uh, URTC recommended cutoff. So, coming to beta deglucan, a variety of assays are presently available. Uh, what about the, um, how do they compare in the lit available literature? So, overall, the sensitivity and specificity has varied across the studies. And uh, at present, it is not used to rule in invasive aspergillosis. Our data also showed quite good sensitivity, although the specificity is quite poor. And higher cutoffs are beta deglucan as compared to, say, galactomannan as well. So, uh, over the last five to six years, as um, PCR has been, um, there is increasing evidence of use of uh, aspergillus PCR both in blood and bile. So, based on the current criteria, as, uh, two or more consecutive samples in plasma, serum, or blood, or for bile, two, uh, two, or more, two or more duplicate tests, or if you have a paired sample, one each would be considered as positive. So, overall, bile compares better as compared to, say, serum. While uh, the data is uh, rob robust for patients who have uh, who are immunocompromised with underlying neutropenia, for non uh, patients without neutropenia, the evidence is not as strong. So in our data also, the sensitivity is quite good. However, still uh, specificity for uh, PCR is not as good. And also, most of the uh, although variety of commercial assays are available, only limited, only the aspergillus is actually prospectively validated and standardized. Coming to the treatment aspect, so. The greatest evidence is with uh, azoles, particularly voriconazole. However, over the last five to six years, we have had uh, two non-inferiority trials which have compared posoconazole and isavuconazole and have been shown to be non-inferior. If azoles are contraindicated, you, uh, the second option would be liposomal amphobe, although there has been no head-to-head -head comparison between liposomal amphobe versus voriconazole. Echinocantins are usually given in salvage uh, settings. However, if all other options are contraindicated, they can be used as upfront single agent. Upfront dual therapy, the evidence is limited. The only RCT which was done did not show overall mortality benefit except in a subset of patients. 
Now coming to the mortality, overall crude mortality rate is, has been quite high in our cohort as in uh, the other literature as well. Over the last 5 to 6 years with increasing recognition, there is around 5% reduction from 80 to say 75%. Well, even for the ASPICU cohort, which was probably uh, around 8-9 years back, so even there, the mortality rates are quite high, 70%. And even the FISF cohort with non-classical population, it's around 70%. So just to touch upon CNS aspergillosis, we had reported a uh, series of uh, 10 patients who were immunocompetent, who had predominantly uh, isol uh, either isolated CNS involvement or concomitant sinus or skull base involvement. Most of these patients were managed medically. Only three of these patients required surgery overall and the mortality was quite low, uh, only 10%. If you compare with other uh, other literature, uh, patients who have concomitant lung involvement usually tend to have higher mortality as compared to say patients who have isolated CNS involvement. So now I will call uh, Ketana to discuss about invasive candidates. Thank you, Dr. Anuj. We now move on to invasive candidiasis, which is also associated with a high morbidity and mortality and is a prevalent IFI in the critically ill patients. Coming to the spectrum of invasive candidiasis per se, it mainly involves bloodstream infections or candidemia followed by deep-seated infections, the most common of which are intra-abdominal infections. Also involved in the spectrum are candidemia that dis disseminates to different organ systems as mentioned. Common risk factors for invasive candidiasis include surgery, uh, immune suppression states such as hematological malignancy, solid organ transplant and neutropenia, presence of central venous catheters and patients who are undergoing hemodialysis or to, are, are given total parental nutrition. Coming to our experience with invasive candidiasis, invasive candidiasis follows invasive aspergillosis as the second most common invasive fungal infection in critically ill patients, ranging from 20 to 45 percent over these six years. Comparing the baseline characteristics of our cohort with the reported literature, our patients again are relatively younger and are more morbid with a higher SOFA score at admission. Five days was the median time to diagnosis of invasive candidiasis, which has improved over the years, possibly attributable to the use of non-culture based diagnostics and rapid automated culture detected systems uh, leading to earlier diagnosis. Amongst risk factors for invasive candidiasis, our cohort had 40 to 50 percent of patients who had diabetes mellitus. Almost all our patients had a central venous catheter in situ and had either single site or multi site candida, candida colonization. In addition, more um, higher number of patients had corticosteroid use for different indications, and 50 to 70 percent of our patients had prior antifungal exposure in the last 30 days. Coming to the isolates of candida in these invasive patients with invasive candidiasis. Over the last decade, there has been a paradigm shift from candida albicans to non-albican species. We report similar findings where our uh, isolate showed 87% of non-albican species involving uh, paracillosis glabrata tropicalis and the recently discovered multidrug resistant candida auris. Looking at the available antifungal susceptibility results, uh, it is important to note the candida auris susceptibilities. Almost 18% of our isolates were candida auris isolates, out of which 92% are fluconazole resistant, 35% were amphotericin resistant, and high MICs were reported to voriconazole in almost 46% isolates. No pan resistant isolates were identified, and all these uh, isolates were sensitive to echinocandines. These results have an implication in treatment for invasive candidiasis in choosing the antifungal drug and also highlight the need for strict infection control practices. Now, another overlooked risk factor is the candida colonization in the ICU. We had done active surveillance for candida colonization and subsequent invasive candidiasis in our patients and found 42% of our patients to be colonized with candida species. Previous antifungal use and duration of indwelling device, that is the urinary catheter, were found to be significant factor, risk factors for colonization. Out of these 42% patients, 12% of patients went out to develop invasive candidiasis. A recently reported systematic review reported patients with, colonized with candida to be three times more likely to have invasive candidiasis as compared to a cohort which was not colonized. Additionally, we detected 
19% of our patients in the ICU to have candiduria, out of which 9% patients had developed invasive candidiasis. In these patients with candiduria who develop invasive candidiasis, appropriate elimination of the source becomes challenging due to antifungal susceptibility one and uh, variable pharmacokinetics and drug penetration into the different uh, systems. When we have candiduria, with echinocandins being the first line for invasive candidiasis currently, they have poor urinary penetration which leave us other drugs such as fluconazole and amphotericin B deoxycholate and local installation of amphotericin B. As we have seen, our resistance, our, our isolates are now becoming resistant to fluconazole and now uh, the remaining options are amphot deoxycholate. We had tried amphotericin deoxycholate bladder wash in seven of our patients with suspicion of invasive fungal infection with persistent candiduria or candida oris candiduria. Amongst these patients, uh, 50 milligrams of amph amphotericin deoxycholate was administered as a ir continuous irrigation or an intermittent irrigation for five days. Out of, and amongst these patients, clearance of candiduria was observed in all seven patients with a favorable outcome that is discharge in five of these patients. Looking at the investigations for invasive candidiasis, the use of beta deglucan to diagnose uh, invasive candidiasis in critically ill Literature reports a wide range of sensitivity and specificity ranging from 0 to 100%. Our, uh, our studies report a high sensitivity of 100% but a lower specificity of 15 and 23%, probably attributable to the high percentage of false positives, both related to patient-related factors such as heavy candida colonization or mucositis or medication-related factors such as use of albumin, IVIG, presence of surgical gauze or hemodialysis filters. A higher cutoff of almost four times the recommended cutoff was noted to maintain the sensitivity of 100% and increase the specificity to 53%. This gives us an idea that beta deglucan is to be used in conjunction with the clinical presentation and other investigations in diagnosing uh, invasive candidiasis. Briefly looking at the management of invasive candidiasis in critically ill, as I mentioned, the first line is of treatment of choice is echinocandins, especially in those patients with septic shock and multi-organ dysfunction. Fluconazole is an alternative treatment option, although we should be mindful of the use of fluconazole considering our antifungal susceptibility profile and the isolates that we are getting in our setting and, uh, and all, both in initiation of treatment and while considering step down of treatment after using echinocandins. Looking at our outcomes in patients with invasive candidiasis, we initially had a crude mortality rate of around 65 to 70%, which are possibly attributable to the high, high morbidity and the increased SOFA score, uh, baseline SOFA score, which has declined now to 43% again, possibly again because of the use of non-culture diagnostics, earlier diagnosis and earlier diagnosis and aggressive management. Invasive candidiasis has a changing epidemiology now and with the advent of more drug resistant isolates, uh, early diagnosis, appropriate source reduction, uh, prompt antifungal treatment and infection pre uh, prevention from the cornerstones of appropriate management. I would now like to call upon Dr. Adarsh for this. Thank you. Thank you, Kirzana. So I'll be dealing with histoplasmosis. Now, when we compare to the global epidemiology, India is a country which is uh, hyperendemic for histoplasmosis. Now, uh, this is the epidemiology map of histoplasmosis. We see that uh, cases are reported uh, throughout uh, the country, but mostly in the northern and uh, northeastern states of uh, India. And this is uh, along the Indo-Gangetic plain, which is a fertile soil for the growth of the fungus. Now, now I would like to... Uh, um, tell about our data on the diagnosed cases of histoplasmosis between 2019 and 2022. We had 21 patients with a male-female ratio of 16 is to 5 with a mean age of 47. And when we compare uh, our epidemiology, this is in agreement with the uh, published uh, literature previously. Uh, most of our patients were from the uh, northeastern states like uh, Uttar Pradesh and followed by Uttarakhand. At least 62 percentage of patients had uh, 62 patient percentage of patients had at least one comorbid illness, and less 38 percentage didn't have any comorbid illness. 
diabetes was the most common uh, comorbid illness and followed by use of immunosuppressants uh, like steroids interestingly we didn't have any hiv positive patient in our cohort there was one patient with idiopathic cd4 lymphocytopenia coming to the clinical presentation the most common presentation was with fever weight loss loss of appetite and less common presentations include pulmonary symptoms cutaneous lesions ocular symptoms and hoarseness of voice now the common presentations uh, which we have seen include po with or without weight loss cytopenias hepatosplenomegaly cutaneous and mucosal lesions followed by cases of adrenal insufficiency however uh, the classical description of uh, acute and chronic pulmonary uh, histoplasmosis were less common in our cohort histoplasmosis is a great masquerader because of this uh, varying presentations we can confuse it with tuberculosis hematological and lymphoreticular malignancies and solid organ malignancies so this image shows the cutaneous lesions in histoplasmosis in one of a patient with uh, t cell lymphoma regarding organ involvement the most common organ involvement involvement was reticular endothelial system uh, that is either as hepatosplenomegaly or cytopenias uh, this was followed by lymph node enlargement then lung and we had uh, rare manifestations in the form of ocular and laryngeal involvement disseminated histoplasmosis defined as at least two or more than two organ involvement was present in 12 patients we didn't have any cns renal or cardiac involvement so isolated organ involvement Uh, which included adrenal and laryngeal histoplasmosis we had nine cases of adrenal histoplasmosis in which five had isolated adrenal involvement and there was an interesting case of laryngeal histoplasma that is vocal cord involvement without any other organ involvement except for cervical lymphadenopathy an important problem in uh, diagnosing histoplasmosis is the delay in diagnosis so there was a mean delay of around 6 months and 17 out of 21 patients there were evaluated outside without a diagnosis and four of them have been started on empirical att from outside so this is in agreement with the uh, western literature so that is due to the low index of suspicion as well as the great similarities with other illnesses we have diagnosed histoplasmosis uh, into proven and probable proven by the uh, basis of histopathological demonstration of the yeast and probable by the histoplasma urine antigen detection although fungal culture is considered as the gold standard cultures were either not done or not available for our patients histoplasma urine antigen test was done in 16 patients it was positive in 9 and among the 9 positive urine antigen tests seven also were proven histopathologically and the kit used oidx uh, it is a rabbit monoclonal antibody directed against the histoplasma galactomannan molecule the problem is the false positive reactions which can occur with other endemic mycosis uh, although uh, most of the endemic mycosis they are not uh, prevalent in our country talaromyces marnaphy is prevalent in the northeastern states of india false negative results can occur in localized pulmonary histoplasmosis coming to laboratory parameters varying combinations of cytopenias and elevated alkaline phosphatase were present in majority of our patients the treatment which we gave induction with liposomal amphotericin b the standard of treatment in disseminated histoplasmosis was given in 15 out of 21 patients with a mean, mean duration of liposomal amphotericin b 14 around 14 days and all the patients received maintenance therapy with itraconazole after the induction phase among which two of them received the super bioavailable form of itraconazole the first therapeutic drug monitoring it was available only for five patients in whom three of them target level has been achieved whereas in two it was suboptimal interestingly the target levels were achieved in both patients who were on suba itraconazole uh, which tells the uh, importance of this drug to be used as a maintenance therapy and coming to outcome uh, when we compare the mortality in our cohort it is uh, less when compared to literature from india as well as uh, the global literature however our follow up is still going on there are patients who are still on treatment however all patients who are on follow up are doing good so with this i would like to hand over to dr sayan to discuss on cryptococcus thank you um thank you dr adarsh so my part will be to cover invasive cryptococcal diseases so this fungus came into picture with the onset of hiv pandemic and the invasiveness of the fungus uh, was proven 
and it spread worldwide uh, we uh, look at the global map then we will find that after the sub-saharan countries we scattered the largest burden of uh, cryptococcal meningitis patients or invasive uh, cryptococcal diseases india stands next to them as of the data 2017 in uh, the systematic reviews recently published from india it is also there that 11000 annual cases we are dealing every year of dysmetic cryptococcal disease so uh, there are some positive signs with the advent of ART and improved access to ART and improved access to antifungal drugs. There are decreased in number of mortality and incidence. Uh, and also we are seeing a change in the trend of uh, incidence and mortality in HIV positive population. However, in the HIV negative population, we are uh, facing a constant uh, rate. So if we analyze the risk factor, we'll be uh, clarify this thing. Uh, if we see at the Western data and the left hand side, uh, we will be seeing that HIV is no more the uh, predominant risk factor there. Along with HIV, solid organ transplant, other autoimmune diseases or uh, hematological malignancies are coming into play. And uh, also we are getting 21% uh, of the population which are immunocompetent. If we had, uh, see at the Indian data, we will also see that 15% we are getting immunocompetent. However, in India, uh, HIV is the dominant risk factor. If we see at the AIMS department, our departmental data, we will see that though HIV is the dominant risk factor, we are getting 26% immunocompetent patients. So coming to the spectrum of the disease, so uh, it is an ubiquitous fungus. Uh, the first point of contact uh, while we breathe in the fungal uh, uh, burden is the respiratory epithelium. So it can cause the uh, uh, formation of a solitary nodule, which later can form a uh, cavitate in the immunosuppressed population. When it uh, affects the immunocompetent, it's never picked up. But when it affects the immunocompromised, it can have some lower respiratory uh, symptoms. If we uh, don't pick it up early, then it can spread to the brain and cause cryptococcomas or meningo meningitis or meningoencephalitis based on the host immune status. If you see the fungal skin lesions, we are again dealing with an invasive form of the disease. Uh, uh, and it's the third most commonly involved organ. And none but not the least, we should uh, comment on the prostate, where uh, it is notoriously uh, causing relapses in a uh, 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 disseminated cryptococcus patient because it is acts as an immunologically inaccessible sanctuary sites. So uh, when a fungus spreads uh, in an immunocompromised source, it literally can involve any organ system. So we are presenting a case in the right hand side, which was admitted in our ward, is a 55 year old male. Otherwise, uh, uh, no other co comorbidities present apart from uh, controlled sugars. He was diabetic and uh, he presented gradual onset uh, chest, anterior wall chest swelling. So uh, also he had subclinical meningitis. So the patient uh, who could have thought that it is a fungal mass, but when biopsied, uh, it showed only macrophages studied with yeast cells. Uh, she was, uh, he was treated with uh, three, uh, six weeks of uh, uh, amphotericin B and uh, uh, flu cytosine. And then uh, he was uh, shifted to surgery ward for surgical resection. So coming to our data, so we were dealing with mainly those patients who had cryptococcal meningitis who required admission in hospital management. Our total patients were 47 with a mean age of uh, 34.5. We had a male predominance uh, in the HIV population, it was mostly male, but in non-HIV population, male and female were almost equal. And we had a sizable amount of non-HIV population as well. The median duration of presenting symptoms were slightly higher in our non-HIV population uh, due to the protracted course of uh, the illness. And now uh, coming to our clinical features, most of the patients uh, like other meningitis uh, presented with fever, headache, vomiting and uh, meningism signs. But 17% uh, of our patients of cryptococcal meningitis has had vision loss. When we compare the clinical features between HIV positive and negative ones, headache, fever and uh, this meningism features were slightly more uh, prevalent in the HIV positive group. If we come to the management part, so the management is consists of three phases, induction, consolidation and maintenance. In induction, we need a proper antifungal in proper doses so that we achieve a good uh, stay safe concentration. So we use liposomal amphotericin B and flu cytosin according to the guideline in most of our patients of 78%. 12% patients we use amphotericin B deoxycholate and in 4% patients we had to add fluconazole. Uh, those patients who were uh, tolerating these drugs and uh, were difficult to achieve the culture sterility. So the median duration of our patients in HIV and non-HIV group was four weeks of induction regimen. And it was slightly higher in patients who culture revealed cryptococcal gati. Total culture positive patients were 18, out of which 11% were cryptococcal gati. Most of them were uh, neoformans. And another thing is uh, when we repeated the cultures in 11 patients, we saw that uh, cultures remain, tend to remain positive beyond two weeks in 45% of the patients. 
so we had to achieve cultural negativity and we had to achieve symptomatic improvement before we can switch to the consolidation phase so that's why maybe uh, we had a, a you know, median duration of induction phase up to four weeks so coming to the management of raised ICP, which is another important aspect of management of these patients apart from antifungals. So uh, it has been proven in the study that in immunosuppressed population where baseline CSA pressure is more than 25 centimeter water, uh, in those group of patients, even a single repeat LP after the uh, diagnostic tap can reduce the mortality from 17% to 8% at uh, almost 50%. So our 43% patient required repeated lumbar puncture and 4% uh, of the patients only required VP shunt. When we compare this data with, our, uh, with the TBM patients, uh, TBM patients more frequently require shunts and uh, here we only manage this uh, raised ICP with repeated LPs. Dexamethasone and all other medical management has very limited role in uh, managing this increased CSF, uh, increased CSF pressure in these patients. So coming to our outcome, so all cause uh, in hospital mortality rate was 42.5%. Uh, it was slightly higher in the HIV negative group. So it is in the range of uh, lower middle income countries uh, globally, but uh, HIV negative group had a higher mortality due to uh, uh, late uh, presentation mainly and uh, uh, late suspicion. And this group also required long uh, induction therapy. Another thing was the you know, microbiological relapse rate, which was 8.5%, which was slightly higher in the HIV positive group, uh, but uh, somewhat in the range uh, if we com compare with the global uh, rate. And uh, paradoxical Irish, which is the immune uh, reconstitutional inflammatory syndrome, which incidence was 6.4% in the HIV positive group. So coming to the screening and preemptive part of the therapy. So uh, after four decades of our experience with dealing with this invasive fungal disease, we realized that uh, despite proper antifungals, uh, mortality rate is quite high even in the uh, high, high resource setup. And uh, we have uh, seen that if the uh, cost benefit analysis is done, uh, screen and treat strategy can be cost effective in those patients uh, where uh, in this patient population uh, of advanced HIV cases where the cryptococcal antigenemia is more than 3%. And the global cryptococcal antigenemia rate is 6% in the CD4 less than 100 HIV positive patients. And our departmental study also uh, proved that 6.8% uh, was the uh, asymptomatic uh, anti uh, antigenemia prevalence in our advanced HIV group of CD4 less than 100. So simultaneously, there was a change uh, in the guideline also, uh, where 2018 there was mentioned that there is no role of antifungal primary prophylaxis. But in 2021, uh, we have endorsed a screen and treat uh, approach where uh, we are uh, doing serum cryptococcal antigen. If it comes positive, then we give the patient short admission and do LP. If LP is also positive, then we are treating a subclinical meningitic patient with antifungals. And uh, if we are not getting LP positive, then also we are uh, putting the patient under antifungal to prevent the onset of meningitis. So uh, this uh, uh, change in the, uh, this change is very recent in our guidelines. So I will like to conclude uh, with uh, my part and call Dr. Amandeep to present me. So thank you, Dr. Sayan. Good evening to all. So mucormycosis, uh, was recently highlighted during the second wave of COVID-19 pandemic. So I would like, I would be brief about discussing it. So the incidence of mucormycosis is increasing. If you talk about the worldwide data, the incidence rate is 0.005 to 1.7 per million population. And if you talk about India, it is estimated to be 140 per million, which is about 80 times higher than what is the prevalence in the developed countries. Talking about the study done by the department from 2018 to 2022, total 196 cases of mucormycosis uh, got recruited and majority of the patients were in 2021. The credit goes to the COVID-19 definitely. Another study done across uh, 25 hospitals recruited 1733 cases in a span of six months and the study done by the department also within a span of april to may 152 cases was recruited and which were uh, all were covid associated mucormycosis so talking about the spectrum of involvement uh, rhinocerebral mucormycosis along with the involvement of sinusitis sinoorbital sinopulmonary uh, 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 covers the major part of the spectrum followed by pulmonary mucormycosis and the cutaneous mucormycosis if we compare the Indian data as well as the data from our department, again, the rhino sinus and the rhino orbital part is, covers the major part are followed by the pulmonary and cutaneous. So more of the spectrum is same. Comorbidities and risk factors. Diabetes mellitus is the uh, most common risk factor for 
uh, uh, mucor mycosis followed by in uh, outside studies it has also been seen that patients who got a solid organ transplantation and malignancy associated with hematological part also have a high risk of uh, comorbidities and risk factors this is in this in our patients as we have ckd and cld patients also in the medicine so more, um, some of the patients also have a uh, cld as well as a ckd another study done only in patients who were having covid 19 associated mucor mycosis type 2 blood diabetes mellitus was a high risk factor along with that use of excessive amount of steroids during the uh, covid 19 management in the first wave also led to also we have seen there was a high risk and the number of swab tests prior to the onset of mucor mycosis in the first wave of covid 19 which was also seen in our study to having a risk of mucor mycosis now after getting diagnosed with the help of direct microscopy as well as histopathology and along with the culture the main challenge which comes with the mucor mycosis is management so the cornerstone of management of mucor mycosis is surgery along with the antifungal treatment and the management of the underlying comorbidities and the risk factors the role of surgery is very important as we know that the mucor mycosis there is a tissue necrosis which leads to poor penetration of antifungals so the early complete surgical treatment in addition to the systemic antifungal treatment is important resection or debridement should be repeated as required and for this a multidisciplinary approach is required with the team of ENT department of ophthalmology neurosurgery anesthesia as well as depending upon the spectrum of the mucor mycosis involved we have to make a team and we have to manage the patient now when to start antifungal a study has shown that if we delay the antifungal treatment of for mucor mycosis by 6 days the risk of mortality increases by two per, two fold so that is very important and we have to suspect it early and uh, diagnose and start treat, uh, treatment for this patient now which antifungal is better there are no randomized control trials assessing the efficacy of antifungal regimes so liposomal amphotericin b is the mainstay of treatment the dose is very important the liposomal dose is 5 to 10 mg per kg and that is one thing which we have to remember is there is a no concept of low dose or a no concept of any slow escalation to high dose as the disease is very aggressive we have to treat the disease aggressively second in the line of management is posaconazole and isavuconazole these are never the first line in the management and we have we should use it as a step down approach or a rescue therapy or in a pre existing renal dysfunction, uh, dysfunction we have to consider these options now the patient if we talk about the mortality outcome of uh, patients in our study it was seen to be 32.43% if we compare with the other studies in the india it is more of a same so but the mortality is still high and we have to treat this fungal very aggressively now talking about some of the rare fungus infections which we have diagnosed Uh, two cases were of cladophyia lophora bentiana and one of blastomycetes dermatitis which was recently diagnosed and managed uh, in our department and this was the first case of in india and definitely uh, with the in the diagnosis of these patients the role of mycology lab in the department of microbiology is very important so the credit goes to them also so i would like to call upon now uh, dr ankesh for telling us about the antifungal stewardship adverse drug reactions and the uh, drug levels thank you so thank you sir uh, this is the last topic for today's discussion so to evaluate the use of antifungal in aims we did a study in which we included all the patient with the who are on the systemic antifungal uh, drugs from the 14 different clinical department inclu including medical surgicals and icus and we monitor the health record of the patient and adr all the alternate day till the, till the outcome of the patient so to evaluate it we used an uh, assessment tool and we we monitor we evaluate the use of antifungal with the help of itsa and acmit guideline and in the outcome we monitor the antifungal use whether it was optimal or not optimal tdm and cause of the non optimal use in the patients so we use this table this is pre published table uh, to to evaluate the use of antifungal this include the selection of antifungal drug dosage microbiological adjustment route and duration of the therapy so in our data in the aims the non optimal use of antifungal is around 33% the most common reason is the duration so either it is too long or or either it is too short uh, too short in the patient followed by the selection of the uh, antifungal mostly it is uh, uh, mostly mo in most of the time alternate therapy is selected and followed by the microbiological adjustment so even after the availability of the culture reports the therapy is not adjusted so when it comes to the area of uh, area with the scope of improvement uh, there are four types of therapy we are mostly using either targeted or preemptive therapy in almost 70% of the patient 
our number for the optimal therapy is more than a, uh, above the average around 70 to 82% but when it comes to the empirical or the prophylactic therapy our numbers are around 50% so we have to improve with the empirical and prophylactic therapy so when it comes to drugs so with the liposomal amphotericin b this is mostly started as a either a preemptive or the targeted therapy but in most of the patient this is at the started it, it started with the low dose and gradually build up in the patient even with the normal renal function so this is uh, not as per the guideline and uh, uh, for the commonly used drug other drugs like uh, fluconazole so uh, this drug once it, once it is started it is not adjusted even after the microbiological reports so these are the common reasons for the non optimal use of some drugs so now it comes to, now i'll come to the adverse drug reaction so out of all the systemic antifungal drugs uh, the echinocandine in our study the casfohongin is associ associated with the least adr the adr frequency is 12.5% and uh, the most common adr is uh, transaminitis and deselectrolytemia and uh, as uh, discussed by dr anuj the with increase the incidence of the uh, in, uh, invasive aspergillosis the use of voriconazole is also increased now but the adr frequency in the voriconazole prescription is around 20% the most common adr is transaminitis uh, with the fluconazole, this is mostly started in the patient with the prophylactic or uh, empir empirical therapy. The most common ADR is uh, either thrombocytopenia or transaminitis. And the drug which is mostly associated with the ADR is the uh, uh, liposomal amphotericin B. The ADR frequency is more than 80%, it's 81% in our study. Uh, the most common ADR are diselectrolytemia, nephrotoxicity and infusion related even in, event in around 15% of the patients. So now it comes to the, when it comes to the pharmacokinetics and interaction, it is mostly there in the azoles. So azoles are basically they are cytochrome P450 inhibitors and they are also act as an inhibitor as well as substrate for some cy cytochrome enzymes. So to, uh, to understand uh, with, with more simplicity, azoles are both substrate which will which will uh, alter the level of azole and azoles are uh, inhibitor as well so they will uh, alter the level of other drugs so the common example in india for the substrate is att and the voriconazole interaction so rifampicin uh, induce uh, uh, rifampicin mediated induction of cytochrome enzyme will decrease the level of voriconazole but even after the doubling of the voriconazole the level adequate level cannot be adjusted so the option we have in such scenario, we can shift, uh, we can change the rifampicin with other quinolones and we can monitor the uh, QT interval in the patient. The other difficult combination is uh, voriconazole and phenytoin. So this is the example of both uh, substrate as well as inhibitor. So in this combination, the phenytoin will reduce the drug level of voriconazole while the voriconazole increases the drug level of the phenytoin. So it's a difficult combination to deal with. So to summarize it, the azole with the CYP450 inducers will decrease the level of azole and the azole as a substrate for the, uh, for the uh, drugs with the C, uh, C, uh, azole with the CYP450 substrate drugs, this will increase the substrate, azole will increase the substrate level. So in last, when it comes to the uh, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring, it is uh, recommended for the azoles because of uh, these various interactions. So in our study in the indicated patient, the TDM was done in 45% of the patient, but now this TDM is available for all the drugs. So this number will improve in the future. So this is all about today's discussion. Now I would like to invite Professor Mani Sonaja sir to summarize today's discussion. Thank you, Ankesh. So uh, whenever we talk about nosocomial infections, we think about gram-negative bacteria and rightly so the focus is on gram-negative bacteria because of the rates of extensively drug resistance that we see in our isolates. The rate of uh, XTR a few years back was around 50 to 60 percent. Today it is around 90 percent. So obviously a difficult thing to manage. So we always think about gram-negative bacteria. The idea of this presentation sharing data today was to is to drive home the point that invasive fungal infections are also an important cause of nosocomial infections. So in our data set, it is around 10% of patients with high risk factors who are having IFI. And which are the patients with high risk factors? These are patients who are on ventilator, have invasive lines and uh, are having features of sepsis 
and not responding to IV antibiotics for 72 hours. So in high risk patients, we have this IFI, which has roughly remained around 10% over the years, last six, seven years data. It did show a spike uh, with the COVID-19 thing. It went up to 27%. Now again, it is coming downwards. And what we are talking about is, are these two infections, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis and invasive candidiasis. Now again, uh, the pulmonary aspergillosis is more common in our setting. The frequency has uh, has varied from year to year, but broadly it is 70% IPA and 30% invasive candidiasis. Uh, this is for a medicine ICU. Now this will vary as per the ICU. If you go to gastro ICU, pancreatitis, uh, surgery ICU, abdominal surgeries, the candidiasis rates may be higher, but the message is overall any ICU setting where prolonged ventilation is there due to whatever etiology it may be, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is more common organism among the fungus. And this is being observed for last few years, six, seven years, data has emerged from various centers across the globe that invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is getting commoner. Now this partly may be due to diagnostic criteria that Anush talked about. Now the diagnostic criteria are more liberal and they include biomarkers which are now routinely available. So we need to really focus on these two fungus. Why? Because they have very high mortality rates. Now we see in Candida, six, seven years back of the median time to diagnosis for us was 14 days. That is time from symptom onset, sepsis onset. We were diagnosing at 14 days. That was six years back. Now we are diagnosing at five days. And this has been made possible by availability of a rapid culture system near the ICU that really helps and obviously routine availability of biomarker beta D glucan. And what it has resulted in, the mortality has nearly halved from 70% or to around 40% now. Regarding invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, few years back we were diagnosing the median time to diagnosis was around 8 days. It has slightly improved to 6 days but we do not see any large reduction in mortality. And mind you, this all mortality we talked about today are crude mortality rates. Many of these patients of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis are basically having the risk factor of prolonged mechanical ventilation. That is also the risk factor for your XTR gram negative VAP. So many of these uh, patients are having dual infections. We do not have the exact figure for attributable mortality risk, but it is quite clear that invasive pulmonary aspergillosis has very high mortality rates and this is seen across various centers in India and across the globe. Mortality rate in the range of 60 to 70 percent. So this is a problem area for sure. Now a few points about the treatment aspects. In our clinical practice we are routinely using, we have been using fluconazole for a long time with good efficacy. But now we need to be mindful of uh, using it in the setting of isolates that we are having. So more than 50% of our isolates are Glabrata, Candida, Auris, Candida cruzi, and these have very high level of uh, resistance to fluconazole. So we have to be very careful even while we are stepping down from an echinocandin to fluconazole, we have to very carefully monitor the patient to see if he's worsening after you know, step down therapy. Regarding cryptococcal meningitis, and the last year this guideline has come, it is still being implemented as I understand that all patients CD4 less than 200 are being tested for cryptococcal antigenemia and this preemptive therapy has the potential to alter the landscape of uh, cryptococcal meningitis in PLHIV in India. As we see in Western data, it is more of non-HIV population which, which are having transplant and immunosuppression other causes. So right now in India, two thirds are of cases are in PLHIV. This may change if we are having uh, this preemptive therapy testing and preemptive therapy with fluconazole. Regarding liposomal, so Ankesh talked about 81% side effects, adverse event uh, rates with liposomal amphotericin B. And this data is slightly old when we used to have a different formulation for liposomal. Now we are having different and obviously all of us know from our clinical experience that uh, not all the liposomal amputation B are same. They vary greatly in terms of uh, possible adverse events and efficacy. 
so we should be using the formulation which in our clinical experience has lesser side effects finally a request for all residents therapeutic drug monitoring is very important uh, it is indicated for only these three azoles not for others itraconazole voriconazole and posaconazole uh, and we sh and it, it is very important both in terms of safety of the drug side effects as well as efficacy so in opd basis whenever patient is discharged comes to a tdm level is usually done in in patient setting but sometimes we are missing it when the patient is coming to follow up in opds so please remember to send tdm for these drugs this is very important from opd basis now all these drugs are uh, uh, tdm is available and in fact uh, very thankful to uh, dr imam and dr gagandeep from last few years the armamentarium of investigations available has increased we have all these tdms now routinely available we have biomarkers which are routinely available and also various pcr systems so that has really helped us in uh, understanding of our invasive fungal infections in our critical care settings and wards so thank you if there are any suggestions any comments any questions uh just wanted to say whenever you are sending for fungal serology uh be careful that before starting any antifungal you should send and you should check for the vials which vial you are sending because one of the hospital supply vial that gives false positive for galactomannan so it's better to send it in the plain vial and for beta d glucan beta d glucan actually what we are seeing is in blood culture positive patient it is very high so whatever literature says like if it is more than 80 picogram per ml that is positive but in our patient still we have to do the cut off we have to put so that will maybe this year we'll just fix which one cut off we'll take in our patient because whenever it is positive it's very high it's in thousands so serology i uh, for serology you have to take always take care and interpretation is very important so for icu patient we are now writing whether it is a positive or negative just we give the titer only so that you will have to interpret it in those patient thank you so um, a very good presentation congratulations uh, as said by manish now days we see lots of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis in chest clinic i remember earlier days maybe 10 years back we are not seeing so many cases uh, one important thing i understand maybe because of awareness more more awareness maybe after starting our program id program and more facility of uh, diagnostic test and uh, treatment is also we start early treatment that is very beneficial and we do uh, bronchoscopy we do ball that is also help in diagnosis so i think very good presentation congratulations i just want to share uh, that you know when hiv was the, I, i'm talking of 1990 when i was a junior resident we had a patient who came with acute renal failure uh, then he died we did the autopsy and it was mucormycosis of intestines so that is how mucormycosis because it is angio invasive it can present anywhere so that is the kind of you know uh, thought process you should have that and then came hiv hiv patient will come patient will have what patient will have diarrhea patient will have some headache patient will have difficulty in swallowing so how how do you treat them because nobody will admit them nobody will test them so basically what patient had candidiasis if patient had headache it is most likely cryptococcal meningitis then how do you treat them treat them with septron treat them with oral fluconazole fluconazole oral is very good for cns penetration so sometimes there are patient who have cd4 um cd4 lymphopenia and then you treat them with uh, with 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 liposomal amphotericin b they have cryptococcal meningitis and then follow up oral fluconazole is a good drug also in higher dose for cns penetration 
and then salvage therapy salvage therapy is is very important sometimes patients come they have been treated but they are not improving suppose cns aspergillosis patient have been like surgery has been done then then empiricin b has been given but then what to do and and voriconazole has been given so in in two three patients we gave caspofungin plus voriconazole and it controlled the disease and then what else then why mucormycosis happened one theory is steroid second is diabetes but there were patient who were not diabetic who never received steroids who did not have covid even then they were having mucormycosis so probably the use of mask which was there not clean mask probably it was one of the it could be one of the reasons so clean mask is very important excellent huh? Huh? Cl uh, cloth mask so that was another reason so so it is very fascinating and, and delay is diagnosis is killer so you have to preempt it you have to investigate and rapid diagnostics are important and then we have to treat faster otherwise it is very difficult to treat any fungal disease thank you